If you're a franchisee or a representative of a franchisee and you're watching the live stream, great. If you're watching this as a tax pro, a manager, a lead pro, an area manager, a district manager, I could go on and on and on about your titles. Where's the, uh, make sure I got this right. If you're watching as any of those or any of those capacities, great. Here's something I would share with you. The information that I'm about to share is not anything secret. There's nothing that I'm gonna discuss that I would not tell anybody who is working in any of our stores. There's nothing I wouldn't share. The, ch the challenge here is that I want to be able to let you have an opportunity to open and ask open questions that maybe you're not sure or comfortable sharing with your staff at this point. That's it. The information that I share doesn't matter. It's what you want to have out of this is up to you. And this is taking it from a either a franchisee or a CEO perspective, meaning if you've got a business, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, these are probably tactics and strategies that will help you understand how to get and retain people. This training will not be presented over to the other, or the group that just left. They're not going to be getting this training. In fact, I will be asking them questions related to this training, but it'll be so that I can get more clarity and give you more insight as the owners, the managers, or the franchisees to give them, or to be able to provide you better feedback. Yeah, they're not the managers. Oh, I just, oh yeah, I did it right, Don, don't blame me. Yeah, she's the rest of kick my ass. Where's my, I want to see that. She was about to, you saw her? She's coming aggressive, she's ready to beat me up. I don't know if I can take on Don, she's pretty tough. Well, at least that's what your husband told me. <laughs> all right so again if you just jumped on or you're jumping on here here's here's my disclaimer there's not going to be any information that i wouldn't share with the staff member or team member so if you are watching this and you're thinking well is this for me it could be but everything that we do as a company revolves around building a team and that in, that includes partnerships like the ones that we have together here if I don't build teamwork and team and better relationships every day, then our business can't grow. It's a very simple formula. You can't grow without people. You just can't. Many people would like to disagree with that, but a good quality team is everything. And then you look at that in sports and in anything that's competitive today, which business is, because business is what we call blood sport. If you look at it, the team that wins is the most organized, the most prepared, the most cohesive teams win teams that work together win and I believe that the reason that some of you and even including myself or some of us have experienced trouble growing our businesses is because we have experienced trouble building teams that's it simple now some of you have brought some of your teams here today or will continue to bring teams to our events I would tell you that they probably are the best fit now but they may not always be the best fit forever I want to share with you ta some strategies, tactics, and how you're going to find the right people and how you're going to keep and retain those people as well. So this is called sharing your vision. Did this work? Oh. I know what I did wrong. Okay, we'll just use this because I have fingers. There you go. All right, so this is called sharing your vision. My objective, what I'm about to share with you is how you sell your current and future team on the idea of offering more products or how you sell more products. I was going to fix this, but in good, how selling more products is good for the business and for them. You see, this is the challenge. Many of us would like to say, let's go and offer insurance. Let's add X, Y, Z to our business. But a lot of that just sounds like work. That's all it is. You're dressing up an opportunity as work for them. And our goal here is to show you, or my goal here is to show you how you can actually position this to not being work to them. But before we actually get there, I have to share with you that the first step in doing this is creating a positive mindset. You see, the mindset of a leader is totally different from that of a follower. Now, in all aspects of our life, we are going to be in both roles. We will be leaders and we will be followers. 
We will be doers and we'll be supervisors, if you will. It just depends on the relationship. I see that in, in my personal relationships, either in the church or with my, my fiance. I mean, sometimes I'm the doer and sometimes I'm not, right? Sometimes I have to be following her and sometimes I have to be leading, probably more following, but <laughs> men know what I'm talking about. But we do understand that there are different roles. But the real goal here is to get you in the right positive mindset. And how do we do that? Well, first off, before you can sell your team, you must have the right mindset. What is a mindset? It's an established attitude or belief. An established attitude or belief. It's how you present something to somebody determines how you come with a mindset. And I believe that if you come with the right mindset, you'll be able to actually sell your vision. So if you're watching this now, and this is because I've recorded this, you've already begun your mindset shift. Because if you're here today, you've already made the decision that you wanna grow your business, You've already made the decision that you need to grow a team and that you have to make a change in your business. So you believe, this is what I believe you believe, your business needs more services, insurance is the right choice, it is possible to do this, your future looks better with this business model. I believe this is your attitude and belief that you've already taken on. Would you all agree? Yes. yes. So you are here. So you've already started the first step, which is the mindset. Now, if I look at this, I look at everybody here and I think, okay, I know they believe it because you've invested your time, energy, and money. When anybody does those three things, I know for sure they're invested and they're committed. So your mindset shift has already begun. So let's continue. The right mindset. We often forget these things, which is number one, it's your business. I have to say that again, it's your business. It's your business. Now, if you're representing a franchisee or a business owner here, it is still your business. Because if you actually are sitting here today as somebody who is representing a franchisee or a business owner, if you have the ability to sit here and actually listen to this and take responsibility, the business wouldn't run without you. So without you, it doesn't matter. They, the owner could say, well, you're not the owner and I'd just walk away, right? Then you'll know who the real owner is. I've said that time again, you know, time and time again, the, the business runs because of people, not because somebody says I made an investment. So it is my investment because even if it wasn't money, it's time and energy. These, these things have to be understood. If you don't understand that this is my investment, this is my business. I have to take ownership of it and it's my future because the mindset shift begins when I understand these three things. If I don't take ownership of my business, I own this, you know, this is my investment and it is my future. If you don't say these three things constantly to yourself, then your mindset is probably favoring the opposite. Everybody should have a say so, you know, everybody invests time so they deserve their say. And well, I care about my staff or my team's future more than myself. Sometimes that can be positive, but sometimes it can be very negative for your business, especially when it comes to finances. If you think about your staff financially before yourself, I'm going to tell you, although it sounds like it'd be the right thing to do, as a business owner, you have to put the business in yourself first. And not because it's selfish. It's the only way the business will survive is if you survive, right? Nobody wants to go underwater to save somebody else. You have to save yourself first. They, they say it on every plane flight that you ever get on. Before you give somebody else a mask, what do you do? Put your own on first. And I say that as respectfully as possible without having to, 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 to say that, oh, well, you, you shouldn't care about people. I would just tell you, your business has to grow. So here's your mindset shift. Last, it's my decision. Now this has probably been the one that People get stuck on. Now, I, I'm going to share this with you because I know it is. If you've been in the business longer, or any business, doesn't matter this business, but you've been in the business longer than two years, and I'm talking about taxes, three years, four years, five years, you probably have some people who have been with you for a while. Maybe people who have worked with you for years. And if you don't, that might actually be a blessing, just to be honest with you. But if you do, you're asking them or yourself, do I want to add insurance? You've already made that commitment. Then you ask them and they say, well, I don't know, maybe. Anybody been there? Maybe, 
maybe I want to do it. It sounds like a good idea. Oh, but I got to get a license. Eh, we'll think about it. You know what? I only signed up for taxes. I'm not going to do that. This is the challenge with most of us today. This is the shift. It's my decision. If you want to be successful in anything and you're the leader of this business, then you have to tell them it's my decision. There is no choice here. It's my business. It's my investment. It is my future on the line. And it is my decision to add insurance or financial services to my business, period. There is no other decision to be made. There is, this isn't open for debate. As a leader and an organizational owner, you have to take this on. So a leader in a business is like the captain of a vessel. You call your business the, the vessel. It is our earned right to decide what we as a team will do, period. There should be no room for debate. Someone must make a decision at all times. That's how businesses are run, ladies and gentlemen. Remember this because some of you are allowing your staff, your teams to make decisions that are impacting the future of your business, not the future that you deserve. And I say this pretty candidly, but I would also say that you're allowing people to give communication is good, saying, can I get your feedback? Can you give me your opinion? Could you share with me what you believe we should change here? Those are good feedbacks to get, right? How should we, what kind of cookies should we buy our customers this year? That's a damn good question, right? You shouldn't ask them, should I change the whole course of my business and start asking, adding more services and make more money? That's not a investor, I mean, that's an investor decision, not a, my store manager decision. If they had skin in the game, if they have money to stay at stake with you, okay, now they have a place to sit at the table. Remember that. When they haven't invested, and if you think time is an investment, trust me, I believe that, but you've been there just as long them. Your, your, your word means, means, just, means so much more than just theirs, if I could say that. All right, so here's an exercise. Preparing for change. And this is the challenges that will arise. There are going to be challenges in changing your business. Typically, these challenges are not just processes and procedures. We have found that the biggest challenges are people. <laughs> we, we as people get comfortable and enjoy following routines. Most people don't like change. Change can scare a person. To better prepare, let's ask ourselves a few questions so we can or we are prepared. People don't like change. And I know that for a fact, if I go to your office and throw away some of your posters so we can get that kid in there, you're going to freak out. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes that are going to freak you out. We all get it. Trust me. It's going to a new restaurant. It's traveling to a new place or it's implementing a new change in your business. So here's some steps we can take or questions we can ask. Who is this or who is going to resist change in our organization? You already know who they are, by the way. You know who those people are. Then no matter what you say, they're going to say, I don't know if I'm ready for that. You probably learned a lot about them during this Phoenix change. How many of them were complainers and whiners and bitchers and moaners and didn't want to change? How many people quit? You know, I, I can't believe this, but I would tell you there was probably at least, at least 50 franchisees that I'm aware of. And that's just based on corporate numbers of people who quit Liberty tax this year just said, I am not going to do this anymore because they didn't want to move to Phoenix. Think about that. Really? Yeah. Think how stupid that is. Just so you know, I don't want to change my business. I quit. What are you a baby? Right. <laughs> it's hot outside. <laughs> like this is the stuff we're going to get from people. This is the complaints you're probably getting right now by implementing change in your organization. Here's another one. Who or why are they going to resist it? Is it because it's different? Is it because it's not familiar to them? Because that's really, we all live in a comfort bubble. We all do. You know, and some of you, I mean, it's easy to point out. If I asked you to come up here and do a presentation, some of you would freak out, probably quit. Because <laughs> it's outside of your comfort zone. 
these are the things we have to know who's going to do it and why they're going to do it. That's number two. And number three is how will this change benefit this person? These are the three things I need to know about the person who, how, and how, or who, why, and how. These are the things I need to know. And the reason I need to know how is so that I can be prepared to talk to them. Do y'all already know these people, by the way? Yes. <laughs> Everybody got somebody in their mind? Yeah. I lived this already. <laughs> All right. Exercise two, empower your mindset. So let's resell ourselves on the reasons behind our decision to add insurance. Now I have to say this because the people that you've thought about right now are still trying to sell you on not doing it or selling you on reasons why it won't work or reasons why they should never do it, or the reasons why you should never do it, right? Well, I had a cousin who was insurance, man, and they suck, it said it sucked, they didn't make any money, right? They all tell you the stories. It's always hearsay, it's never firsthand. You've got family members who told you not to get into Liberty, or to get into any insurance business, or to get in sales, or to go on a date with that guy or girl, right? or to eat at that restaurant. You've had a salesman telling you all these things. So how do we resell ourselves, right? Here's what we do. Don't think it, ink it. What does that mean? If you made a decision, you need to write it on paper. If you're saying, I made a decision to do this business, you've signed the contracts, you've moved forward, and you put it in their contract. What made you decide to add insurance to your business. You can answer this question right now. You can write it down, you know. This is probably one of the power, most powerful things you can do is to, to always reaffirm yourself of what it is that made you decide to do this. See, some of us get really hot on doing things. Some of us get really, really hot on doing something and then a month, two months, a week, whatever it is, you flake out and say, nah, maybe not. Maybe that's not it. Maybe I really don't want that watch or that car. It's called buyer's remorse, if you will. Many of us experience that. And I would challenge you to re reaffirm to yourself on a daily basis, or at least here today. And I'm actually going to give you a, a minute or two here. This will probably be better. To write down why it is you decided to add insurance and financial services. Why is it? Let's write that down. One, two statements, three statements. Let's do it together. Because this reaffirmation should help you. What, did you, what are you expecting to change in your business because of it? Or what positive impact is it going to have? In? Because those are the things we need to reaffirm ourselves on. positive impact is going to happen? Who's going to change? What benefits will you experience? And don't even think just short term, think long term. What is it going to change in your business financially? What kind of opportunities or literal freedoms will you receive because of this? Reaffirm it to yourself. This is key in growing your business, by the way. How far, how much closer will this bring you towards your goals? Maybe you have some financial goals. Maybe you have some theme goals. I call them things because maybe you, uh, you, you already dreamt about the yacht or the vacation home or the, the Lambo theme, the Lambo. Right? Is, that, is this pushing you in that direction? Is it, maybe it's for more time with your families. Maybe it's more time. But why did you make this decision? Because it wasn't just because you wanted to help people save money on their rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I have nine more months behind us. Mm -hmm. These are good. Yeah, you want to share some? This would help everybody to get their uh, creativity going. Anybody want to share those? Nine months to hire people. That's great. Tell everybody, look, I'm doing this. You're going to do it. Not. There you Look, go. These are my ads. I'm bringing new people in every week. There you go. Either you're in the class and you've passed by June and you have your license by July, or 
Yes, you were the manager last year. You might be prepared next year. That's right. I like that. What are some of the reasons that we're doing this? Anybody? I'll be 65 in five years. Be 65 in five years? I like that. <laughs> to allow us to transition from a seasonal business to an annual year-round business. Annual year-round business? Which will help our profit margin and allow us to eventually replace our tax revenue with a more solid, dependable income. So year-round business, replace <laughs> tax revenue, God bless you to become a year round business who makes year round revenue, who can actually probably, and this is the, what my key is, probably keep your profits from tax season. <laughs> she has in the Jesse? Uh, higher retention rate. Higher retention rate, which, well, just because higher retention is good, what does that create for you? More, 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 stuff to do. more, more revenue. More revenue, more revenue. or uh, would, it, would it create less work? No. Yeah. Eventually. No. Eventually, because you don't have to do as much work to get the customer in. Eventually, you can return your tax pros. You can return your tax pros. You can return your customers, which then in turn, look, it becomes really what the more retention you have, it it basically becomes what we'll call an annuity. Go on. I have no car insurance. So on the ten percent, let's say we get on our car insurance. Uh -huh. Every time they pay for it, we get that years in the future also? Yes, as long as they keep renewing it. Okay. So it's a residual. For me, um, by the time I'm 65, I've got 50000 a month coming in from all my stores. Okay. I love that. And what will that do for you? That'll make my wife happy. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're a smart man. I'm learning from you. I'm going to take notes. Makes my wife happy. It's great notes to take. Yes. Go ahead, Francis. The, 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 the uh, um, main reason that we think to add insurance into our delivery business is so that we can have retention for uh, our uh, employees' retention, our preparers, our managers. Because every year, we hustle a lot to have a good manager for a store. So now we have a uh, good manager, but and then after tax season, they go to unemployment, they collect the money, or they find another job. So next tax year, uh, we have to be hustling again, trying to find a good person, learning, the, uh, I mean, um, training them again. So the, um, mainly that is the reason why we decided to put the um, insurance so that we have uh, more attention uh, for our uh, managers so that next year, yeah, they are gonna be managers, but also they have to have the license in order to sell, and also help us to create more revenue into the stores after tax season, because we have to pay the rent anyway. That's right. Every year. So that is a relief. We, we have something to get uh, some revenue so that we can keep going on to pay the rent. Of the so, so you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? No. Yeah, it's like repeating the same day every year because we're always recurring hiring people, isn't it? I, I felt like I've trained this before. Yeah. Felt like I said this before. I felt like the customers had the same problem before, because you're having to replace people that probably yeah. knew their stuff before. And that is another problem that we have from the customers. They don't like uh, to have a new repayer every year. Right. That's right. That's right. So that is our. That was our main. There you go. These are good takeaways, Miss Anna. Anna Chloe. Go ahead. Uh, at the beginning, um, I thought that um, insurance will push the tax business. At the end, I learned it that maybe not. It's not magic because most of my insurance clients are not my tax clients. My tax clients are not my yeah. insurance clients. So, not to mix it. So don't, don't be afraid. It doesn't work like that. But, yeah. but now I have my um, ex in different baskets. Yeah. My the investment is in different baskets. So she's and diversifying. In a different and a different way. And I'm happy. What's that? She, she, she's di saying that she diversified her business by adding insurance and she feels comfortable now. Are you saying green basket? No. Green. 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 Two different baskets. Like, one one now, I, I, I'm not going to share too much of her financials, but I'll just tell you 
uh, Jean-Francois and Ana Marta make quite a bit of money every month on insurance and residuals from health. They do very well. And they've done that for years. And they're still going to continue to do it. And I'm hoping that they add more business, right? Yeah. <laughs> Some more different lines of business. But these are all good. Uh, we could be here all day and just talk about what's really good for us. But here, here's the real summary that I got from everybody here. You really want to enjoy your business profits. I mean, and be able to say at the end of the day that you go home and, and sleep well at night. I'm not saying nobody's sleeping well here because I know you all eat well and sleep well, by the way. I know that. But, but there's a difference when having to go to the office every day and worry about training somebody you know needs additional training or learn about a new problem that you know that you've already tried to solve 13 times before and looking for more revenue that ain't going to come eight months out of the year unless you do something else. I've sat around tables with people who are looking at our business model and saying, <laughs> where the hell have you guys been for the last you know, 50 years or whatever? You guys are not evolving. Drive by any Liberty store today and you see an empty store right now. They're dead, except for maybe this room. But many stores are dead. And just maximizing your resources is probably the best thing. I mean, you're already paying. If we could get four-month leases, we wouldn't even be here. <laughs> we wouldn't be here, just so y'all know. And I would be with you on that. <laughs> I'd be with you on all that. If we could close all of our expenses off on April 30th and disappear, right? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. But unfortunately, we can't do that. February 28th. <laughs> February 28th. Yeah. Don't call us, we'll call you, right? <laughs> all right. So you made a decision to do these things. Now, what financial impact again will happen? And who will benefit from the success of adding insurance to your business? Now, I'm not gonna, I know you wrote down a lot. Here's, here's one thing I would ask you to write. This is gonna take just a minute. Write down the names of the people who will benefit from your success in this business. The names, be real. And I don't want you to put my business partner <laughs> or my boss or whatever. I want you to write who would benefit. Write that you probably have, most of you have children or grandchildren, a, a, a spouse, A family member, a relative, a parent. <laughs> Y'all are not putting each other's names, I guess. No, I'm just saying. She said American Express. Who will benefit from your success? American Express. <laughs> oh man, they call me all the time. Trust me, <laughs> Mr. Pettis. You seem to be doing really good in your business right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we can extend you another line of credit. <laughs> All right. Put, put. It's kind of funny that, not to get off topic, but American Express seems to always find a reason to give you another card or a line of credit every day. <laughs> but Mr. Bettis, you don't have this card. <laughs> All right. And how will life look in five years because of this decision? It's probably one of the questions I ask myself all the time. To share a little bit of my journey in the last five years in the insurance business. And this is because probably for the first three, I was really, really not as good as I am today. And I'll never be as good as I am five years ago. I, I'm always going to get better. But we've built the system from really not knowing insurance. I didn't come from an insurance background. I didn't come from a background of knowing all these things. I just understood things a little bit better than most as an entrepreneur. And I decided to commit myself to learning my craft and learning about insurance. But for the last five years, a lot of things have changed for me. I went from really not owning, you know, I had one commercial real estate property to now owning three. I had one tenant to having eight tenants today who rent for me in a commercial aspect. I, I've gone from being a single guy to now engaged and about to get married. Um, I've got a house and I'm buying another one right now. I close on Monday on a new home a new big home right on the water. You know, I've changed a lot of things in my business. I've gone from a team of two people to a team of about 20 today, solid year round employees. Um, we've got also a freedom business, which had two agents when I first started me and somebody else. And today we have 160 agents across the country. Um, we've gone from really being a one trick pony in insurance products to having, you know, a little over 5 million in annual premium sales. We, yeah, <laughs> this, this has been five years. And I'm not saying this because of it, it. 
to be very honest with you guys, I mean, we, we make money together, partnerships. But my revenue stream doesn't come from just, pre you know, our partnership as a freedom agent agreement. It's actually from our real sales in our offices, from our real sales generated within my stores. Our Liberty stores did 1.42 million this year. I mean, that's our Liberty stores. We're gonna hit a million dollars in premium by September in just my stores. Just my stores, that's excluding everybody in this room. So insurance has drastically changed my life and it has nothing to do with me being some industry expert who came from some background who had just built empires. I built this by learning and building and sharing and that's why the tools that we provide to you, these are all time tested stuff from what we've done in our stores. I don't introduce anything to you guys that I haven't already tested. So I, we talked about loan programs, we've talked about other things. I will not introduce something to you that I've never done. And this is part of the business. So in five years, what will yours look like? What will your future look like? What will your bank accounts look like? What will your portfolio of investments look like? How many people on your team will be there? If you can see it, it can happen. And if it can happen, it's because you made a decision in your mind to make it happen. These are the things I share with you, not to impress you, by the way, to impress upon you something that with the right mindset, you can make anything happen. And I, I really did say all these things were going to happen. I've told myself for years, we're going to develop this and we're going to build this and we're going to sell this and we're going to get there. Right now, freedom is my vision to, to get you guys producing is the vision. I've already got a very successful tax business who sells insurance. I have agents locally who produce a lot of money for me in different products locally without having to leave the valley. And in fact, I could probably stay here and be very successful. My next vision here is to develop you guys over the next five years, to see you grow, to help you make the millions, to help you get into that next level. That's my vision right now. So I look at the same thing and I have to sell myself, by the way. When I talk to you guys and I say, hey, sell your team on this opportunity that it is what we want and what we're going to do and how it's going to happen because it's my investment. I can take that away from the Liberty Tax stores and I can tell you that's what I do with our Freedom team that you met today. I do that with them. If they're not the right fit, if they don't buy into my vision, if they're not following me, if they don't think that this is the right idea, sorry guys, I made the investment of my time and energy and this is what's going to happen. I'm not a dictator. I'm just, I know what I want. I know what our business needs to go to. So you got to ask yourself these questions. Uh-oh. An error occurred. Uh-oh. Somebody doesn't want me to present anymore. <clears throat> They'll look into it as soon as possible. That's what Google says. There you go. Y'all saw that, right? There you go. Sorry. All right. Next. Hmm. I guess I could just read it off the screen. Reload it. Next is a game plan. Next is a game plan. And you have to have a game plan before you can actually execute any of this. Sorry, guys. Wow. Okay. Every great team in any sport approaches every game with a plan. They study any conditions that may impact their ability to perform. They study their opportunities or their opponent's playing history and they do their homework. Luckily, you have a partner, which is us, Freedom, who will work with you to customize a plan for execution. But it's up to you to take action. Many people come to trainings like this and expect to get all the knowledge and all the tools and all the world so they can go home and make a million bucks. I can help you. I can show you the way, but I can't make you go down that path. Only you can make these decisions. So we have to have a game plan. So let's talk about our game plan. Let's see if it works here. There you go. You just didn't like that slide. Failing to plan equals planning to fail. Many of you have heard this, right? I, I would probably take this a step further and tell you that I don't even actually believe in the word failure. I don't know if you heard Ms. Dea this morning talk about, she's the director of finance, but really I changed the title of her, her department about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. When I've always thought this, I just never made the decision in my business to change it. But I believe that there's no such thing as winning or losing or failure or success. It really is just results. It's the outcome of your, we'll call it efforts or energy put into something. And if we're going to be successful, I, for an example, I changed the name of her department to the accountability and results department. That's it. 
she only holds people accountable. I hold her accountable and she produces results or she tells me what results have been produced. That's it. So if we're planning to fail or if we're failing to plan, we're planning to fail. If I took anything out of here, I'd just say plan. I mean, I would just say, just put the word plan. We have to plan. So nothing is more wasteful than showing up to an office wondering what to do. You all been there? I've done it. Trust me. Some days I still do it. So we all know there's something to do every day. The difference is knowing what exactly that is to do. Leaders must always have a plan to present to their team. So to build a team, you have to have plans. And this is probably one of the reasons why you have these people that we mentioned earlier, or you had in your mind, that aren't listening to you. They're maybe fighting you, or maybe they're not the right fit for what you're trying to accomplish. But these are reasons because they have seen some lack of character from their leaders before. And a lot of it has to do with structure, they, they didn't have structure before because you didn't come with the plan. They didn't have credibility in you because you haven't come with the plan. They don't believe that you'll hold them accountable because you didn't come with the plan. They don't trust you because you're not planning. And of course, your team loses a lot of confidence, the whole team, because of the lack of planning and preparation for the upcoming objectives, the results that you expect. Visionary leaders, people who want to share their vision, have to have a plan. So there is no perfect plan. And what I would tell you guys is the, the common pattern I find with leaders is that when someone believes that our plan must be perfect before we can share them, sometimes we all get together and think, oh, well, unless I have a perfect plan, I can't share it with my team. And this is actually not the case. There's no such thing as perfection. There's only progress in our business. And to build a plan, you have to understand all the things that go into the business. This is probably the most challenging part that I face as a coach to entrepreneurs. I try to help an entrepreneur figure something out, but they ask me questions that are probably what we'll call elementary. See, a business owner is supposed to be, in some respects, somebody who has a doctorate or a master's in entrepreneurialism, right? But then I ask them, can I help you? And they ask me, well, David, can you show me where to find this form and what it does? And if I'm having those questions asked to me, and you have a team. This is if you have a team, not if you don't. If you don't have a team, then it's obvious you have to ask these questions. But if you have a team and you're asking them to do something, but you're not prepared or planning to be prepared to show them how to do it, then you're not going to get credibility and you're not going to be able to become that leader that shares the vision. So you and I will have to, to of course, a, put together a plan. And what I can tell you is I can have a strategy session with each one of you. And in fact, I've done some already. I would love to do more because if you don't have a game plan, you won't be able to go and compete or dominate in your sharing of your vision. So think about all the times in our business model that we've had the opportunity to train somebody, but we weren't prepared. And because of that lack of preparation, we have lost credibility with our teams. Have you, can y'all think of those times? Yes. Anybody want to admit to those times? I mean, even think about Phoenix, the implementation of a new product, a new, a new technology. How many of you all were ready for it personally? So step three is the team challenge. There are two types of team members right now that you have. You have existing and you have new team members. What is going to be the, which one is going to be the most challenging and which one's going to give you the most opportunity? New or old? Old. old. There's a saying, you can't teach an old dog. New tricks. <laughs> That's not always the case, but most times you're going to run into challenges because of former employees that have been with you for years. And now we have to figure out how to approach those employees. How do we work with them, the staff, the partners? We're going to have to work with those people. So here's how we handle existing staff. One of the greatest aspects you can have is a strong team. Our team, or this could be one person or could be multiple persons, must believe in us. They must believe in us so much that whatever decision we make is the right one. The sad truth really is most of our teams don't believe in us. Most of our teams believe we have our own agendas and most of our teams believe they run the business, not us. The most powerful compliment any leader can receive is I believe in you or I depend on you. But the real truth is not that. Would y'all agree with this? If you, and this is not to beat you up because this is me too. 
there have been many opportunities where I have sacrificed and I have put myself in a position where somebody would say, well, the reason I can't go with you on this insurance journey is because David, you promised me the heavens and the earth before. And you know what? I got some dry dirt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to sell them the dirt, right? I've promised them things. I've said, Hey, you know, if we do this, this is what's going to happen for you. You're going to have an opportunity and you're going to be the manager and you're going to make money and you're going to go on vacations and you're going to have the lifestyle that you deserve. Or I've told them, you know, I want to be able to give you a raise and the raise doesn't come or the bonus is going to be huge this year, but it can't come because, well, they didn't hit their numbers, but it wasn't because they didn't hit their numbers. It's because I didn't give them the right training to be able to hit their numbers. I messed up and I put myself in a position for people not to believe in me. We have to take ownership of this now. Sometimes we can correct this. Sometimes we can't just so you know, I'm not saying that this is something that's irreversible. I'll just tell you it takes time. It's kind of like a trust thing, right? In relationships, if there's a cheater in a relationship, it takes time. I hope it takes time to recover it. Maybe it won't be able to be recovered, right? It's what it is. Not to say that it's wrong or right. I'll just tell you, people make mistakes. That's what we've done. And the other party has to make the decision either whether to accept our mistakes and help us recover from them, or they'll never be able to recover from them. And in, in essence, we're going to have to divorce some employees. One other is going to happen. The hard times. We as business owners have felt the pain of dealing or developing a business. Most of us have done it all because we had to. There are many things with, that we don't like doing as business owners, but we must do in order to keep the business running. There's a point in every business where we must hire people and those people learn from us. Here's what happens when they learn from us. They learn the right way, <laughs> they learn the wrong way, and they create their own way and take initiative. Now why I share this with you is because if you've been in business for longer than one day, you've realized you've done a lot of things that you didn't want to do. <laughs> Everybody gets into entrepreneurship or business ownership because they want to be their own boss, right? They want to call the shots and they want to have free time. Y'all sold that one? Y'all remember that one? I want to have more free time, right, Model? That's, right. That's what you signed up for, right? You're like, yeah, four months. Free time, eight months, vacations galore. Come on, man. We all signed up for that deal. We all bought something that really wasn't true. The only difference between us having a job and being self-employed is we don't have somebody telling us what to do. Unless you're married right now. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. Not having somebody to tell me what to do every day is really not that good. Because it allows me to do things that are wrong like not show up on time and not get things done and do shortcuts. So our teams learn from us in so many ways that if I look back at all the things that I train people on, I trained a lot of people the wrong way and those people aren't here with me anymore. I did a lot of not bad or illegal, let me stop there, but I did a lot of not best practices. You know, I was the, I was the franchisee that would say, a return was already sent, but it wasn't sent. You ever been there? No, never been there, huh? Some liars in here. Um, <laughs> checks in the mail, right? <laughs> We've all been there. I'm telling you, although that will solve the problem temporarily, it does not solve the problem with your team, which is they learn bad habits. They're learning from you every day as their leader, every day. And if you decide to take shortcuts, if you decide to not put best practices, if you decide to show up late, if you decide to show up unprepared, they'll learn it. If you decide to show up on time or if not even earlier, if you decide to create standard operating procedures, if you decide to add insurance in the business and you're committed to learning it, so will they. But they have to learn from you. Just remember that everybody learns from you without even knowing it. People will pick up on what you're teaching without you even teaching. And if you don't believe me, look at your children, right? Everybody says they don't want to be like their parents when they were a kid and then they become their parents because they picked up on the mannerisms and the things that you did all your life. They may not 
be exactly like you, just like your children, and neither will your employees, but they will pick these things up. Now, the reason why sharing your vision is so important here and creating that right mindset and understanding how you can create a plan is because the last point here is says they need to create their own. You see, if all you do every day is show up and say, this is what we're going to get accomplished and this is how it's going to happen, you won't actually have a team. You know, you'll be a coach the rest of your life, which is great, but I don't want to be a coach. I want to be an owner, right? There's different levels of leadership and I'm, uh, if you don't know these, I'm going to outline them real quick. And this is not in this presentation, but there's three levels, right? You want to be, there's three levels. No, the number one level of leadership or ownership here is, is an owner, right? Everybody owns a business, but that means they do a lot. And this is just from a leadership perspective in business. You're either an owner, a CEO, or an investor. And you could put owner operator if you want, but it's the same thing. You got three levels here. And I would tell you guys, most of us right now are in the owner operator phase. I even am in some respects. Because I'd like to say I'm the CEO some days, but trust me, if you come to this office, you'll see me doing owner operator shit. <laughs> but it's not because I intend to do that the rest of my life. It's just where I'm at. The investor is the ultimate level. He's the guy who owns the team. He's the Jerry Jones, if you will. <laughs> Anybody know Jerry Jones? Right. And Jerry Jones used to be the owner operator and that's cause he owned the team. You know what I mean? He was the investor and the owner operator and the today. I don't think he's as involved as he used to be, but yeah, well, he's still not as big as he used to be. He used to be there on the sidelines, kicking some ass today. He sits in the, in the investor box, right? And he probably still makes a few phone calls. <laughs> it's probably more than we'd like him to make. Just so you know, <laughs> we need to let somebody else run the team, Jerry. <laughs> So working in or working on. Now, this is a cool mantra that we've all lived by, right? Oh, yeah. How many of you want to work in your business? Raise your hand. In it. How many want to work on your business? That's an investor, by the way. You see, investors put their money and they let it work. That's what you want to do. If you're working in the business, you're working. <laughs> That's it. There's nothing wrong. And by the way, there's no disrespect to either one. Right. They, both, they both play vital parts in the success point. And in fact, people who work make more money than investors, just so you know. People would say, well, I want to be an investor because they make more money. No, 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 no. Just for an example, you look at a liberty tax perspective, right? If you think about it just in earnings and profits, the franchisee makes way more money than a liberty corporate, than liberty corporate makes. I mean, it's just, you all, we all think that they just collect tons of money. If you look at the actual sales, we make more money in percentages. Just like an area developer, I'm a developer. People would say, well, David, you make a lot of money for not doing much. I said, well, you're probably right, but if I worked, because I make more money in my stores than I do on my development, I'd make more money. Working does make more money. The difference is, do you want to work or not? <laughs> That's it, it's just a simple fact. If you want to work, you make more money. If you don't, you can be an investor. So working on or in your business is very important. This has been one of those things that we talked about for so long. Don't work in, work on your business. There's nothing wrong with the idea of working on your business, but it's more important for me to tell you or share with you that working on your business is great, but working in your business first is a key. The challenge that we face is when we work on our business, someone must be working in our business. And if we don't have the people to do it, then how do we intend to succeed? You can't go from the first grade to the 12th grade. There's steps along the way. That's why they make those, those, those desks so small. So you don't fit in them in 12th grade, right? But you got to start them in first grade. You got to graduate here. And the reason I share this with you is because if you want to build a team sharing your vision, you have to understand the business. I talked to very many franchisees who are not in this room today. Maybe some of you at the beginning were this way. They would call me and say, David, David, I want to do this. I want to be so successful and I want to make a ton of money doing insurance and financial services. And I know you can help me. So I say, yeah, I can. Let's do it. And the next day I get a call from somebody who's not them saying, hey, I'm in charge of this. But is this a pilot program? And not, not, by the way, that's not always a bad thing. I'm not going to say that because 
they may have some really good invested interest in a partnership with somebody. And I agree with that 100%. But I asked the franchisee, the owner and the investor, whoever's putting up the money has to understand the business a little bit. Unless, unless they're giving equity to the person in part, then it's good. We can figure that out too. But I can't, I can't tell you how important it is your role as a leader in this business. Expectations. We as business owners sometimes allow our teams to run the business with little to no expectations. In fact, I first started to work on, uh, work on instead of in my business. My expectations were very simple to meet. This were my expectations for a while. Help clients show up, answer my calls. <laughs> Everybody been there? Right? Here's, here's something you should always know. Low expectations are likely to be met. <laughs> you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. I, those are my expectations. Hey, I'm calling. Answer the damn phone. <laughs> right? Hey, client needs help. Go, go help the client. And just be here on time, please. <laughs> being, being on time is a major thing. Yeah, it's so funny, right? Office opens at nine. Can you at least be here by eight fifty nine, please? That's all I ask. Yes, sir. I'll be there at. Okay, we got you. You're a good employee. <laughs> now, by the way, although although these are, I'm not saying these are still not my expectations. Don't get me wrong; these are still part of those expectations. But that was my, that was it. That was my par, if you will. That was where I needed them to be. Anybody want to admit to being there or still being there? Raise your hand. It's still there some days. And by the way, your expectations can change. But this is where I was. So who's the boss then? I believe that a lot of the challenges we face are due to the lack of direction, proper expectations, and a lack of communication by leadership. We allow the team to believe we need them more than we need or of more than they need us. Now, this isn't always true, but emotionally run businesses don't succeed. Here, here's something I learned. In 2014, I went through some really significant financial struggles. I had an expansion that was outrageous from six doors to 14. I leveraged myself heavily with... Uh, with Liberty Tax, I borrowed a ton of money. I actually borrowed nearly a million dollars that year. A million dollars in debt to do some expansion because I thought expansion was the right time to expand at that point in my life. I had just gotten an insurance, but I wasn't as serious as I am today, obviously. But I had a commitment that I wanted to grow my business. And, and back then, I think I, uh, uh, you, we could kind of talk about it in a yardstick mentality. <laughs> I just thought my yardstick was number of stores. If I had more stores, I was more successful. I mean, I just felt more successful this way. So I, I expanded from, from a significant amount of stores, like eight or nine stores I think I opened on top of what I had, or maybe it was six or seven, I don't remember. It was a big number. And I had no real system or structure, and I had low expectations for my staff, which was show up, help customers, answer my calls. That was my standards. And then, so I went in a huge debt hole with Liberty Tax to do this expansion. And don't get me wrong, it, it could have worked out, but it obviously didn't. I, I, not only did I not do well, I actually went down in the stores that I had opened previous years. And some of my stores that I opened did less than 100 returns. In fact, some did like 20 returns, 31 returns. This guy, I made it possible, bro. <laughs> I made it possible. I couldn't service the debt that I had to Liberty Corporate. And because, because I couldn't service the debt, I mean, I was literally in a hole that I couldn't get myself out of. I actually closed six stores that year, right off the bat. I just closed them. No, it was four stores. And then I closed six in the off season. But in order to try to figure this out, and, and actually, I, I actually skipped ahead. At the end of tax season, I called Liberty and I said, you can have them. <laughs> and they were like, the stores you open? I said, no, all of them. They're yours. Come get them. I say, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you owe us a lot of money, and well, we don't want those stores. <laughs> and, you know, that was really the talk that I had, and a lot of it had to do with me.
being arrogant and thinking I could just take over the world at that point, which I think most business owners will get into that mentality for a day or two or 10 years or something. Uh, but, but I went really significantly in debt and I really decided that year that I was going to turn in all my stores, get out of Liberty business. And cause I was going to file bankruptcy because I literally couldn't afford to make the payments back to Liberty tax. There's just no possible way I'd borrowed a million dollars at the end of tax season. I still owed them like 750,000. I don't know how I was going to do it. And if y'all have ever borrowed money from Liberty, it's 12%. So shit, how am I going to pay that back? Right. And I, my bank account was zero at the end of tax season. I mean, literally it was zero. I, I actually had to go get a personal loan to pay out bonuses. So I was really committed to paying my staff, by the way, I was very committed because, well, even though we didn't have a killer season, I blamed it all on myself. And that, that year is when I took personal responsibility because I realized even though at the beginning, as I ended the season, I blamed it on everybody else but me. I really did. I said, man, my, my district manager sucked. And, and I can't believe these store managers didn't do their job. And the waivers, they just clocked in and stole my, my hours. And I blamed everybody else but David. At the end of the season, I realized that it wasn't them. It was me. And I took some personal responsibility that year. And I worked, I ended up working out a deal with Liberty Tax to structure that, that debt. I'm not going to, and it wasn't even on my account. It was actually a, it was actually a good friend of mine and a, a business partner today that really helped me do that structure out a, a settlement. Now this is not, I don't want to go into the side story tonight at dinner. If you'd like me to share it, I will. But the reason I share this with you is because back then before this, even though I was the boss, I used to let my staff run the show. I used to trust in people so much and it wasn't really trust. It was me being lazy. I used to say it's, I trust my employees to do the right things. I used to say that, but that's not really the case. It was really that I was just too damn lazy to monitor. It's really what it is. Y'all ever been there? They'll always do the right thing. They're great people, but it wasn't that because if they were great people, they would have hit results. I let the stores run themselves because I thought I was working on my business, not in it. Right. I set them up. Set it and forget it, if you will. That's actually what I did that year. I went to every single store and I literally set them up. I put the desks in, I put the lights in, I put the signage up. I monitored all that. And then literally January 15th comes around and I said, set it and forget it. Instant office, poof. Success in the making, poof. But it was all me working on my business because that was my mantra back then. That was it. David's working on, not in this business. I ain't doing a tax return again, Malo. <laughs> So what I told myself, I can't believe that shit. <laughs> By the way, it took me, and just to get side note, it took me a year and a half and I got out of that debt. I turned it all around, guys. It's all a mindset. I became the boss. It's always our opportunity to make this decision. So who's really the boss? Your investment equals today's re rewards. Regardless of how we feel about our business is performing at this point, at the end of the day, we are the reason our business is open. Our need to keep people happy tends to lead to us, tends to lead us to believe that we must allow them to make decisions. You've done that? Yes. We want to keep them happy. I believe that in some cases we tell ourselves that we need them more than we need or that they need us. We feel bad. We feel trapped. We feel like whatever move we make, we must get approval from them. You have these people in your business right now. This is how I lived. This is how I made, by this presentation I made, I know it because I've done this. Who's really the boss? We let them become the boss of us. This is a challenge that we must take on. Exercise. Let's do overcoming fears. Whose business is this? Whose is it? Mine. Yours. What gives anybody or anyone, who gives anyone that isn't an owner the right to tell you how to run your business? Who pays who? Think of a past or current employee you work or employer you work for. Now ask yourself this, what would happen if you were asked to do something and you said, no, I don't want to do that. What would happen? I was only hired to do paperwork. I won't throw out the trash. How many of you have had that happen and say, oh, it's okay. You're right. You weren't hired to throw out trash. How many of you have done that? I did it at the beginning. Trust me. I wasn't hired to sell insurance. I'm here to do taxes. You laugh because you've been through it, right, Jesse? Yes. 
These exercises are hoping pointing out the right people, right? We're targeting them. But we allow these people to have an opinion. Isn't that crazy? The guy who doesn't have, or girl, who doesn't have your best interest at heart, is not an investor, has no interest in this business other than getting paid hourly. And we say, how do you feel about adding insurance? <laughs> how do you feel? I don't give a shit how you feel. <laughs> your feelings don't matter here. Unfortunately, you didn't sign the check. Unfortunately, and trust me, it's not to disrespect somebody because I wouldn't tell them your feelings ain't shit here, right? Um, <laughs> that's not the way that I would approach the situation, but it would be a nicer words, but same meaning. I'm sorry to say that unfortunately, the decision has been made that you will sell insurance this year. And then they say, well, I don't think that's something I want to do. Well, then the decision also has been made that your employment separation agreement has been established. <laughs> And you can contact the state agency that might be, you know, maybe supporting you for a while. Confidence builds a following. Now that we can agree on being the boss, here are some action items that we will help or we can help build you credibility as the boss. Have a simple written business plan. Craft your vision pitch. Present the pitch to your new and returning employees. Be firm with your intentions and expectations of them. And last but not least, make sure everything is in writing. So let me break these down real quick. Create a written plan. We're gonna add insurance this year and we intend to add it in X amount of stores by X amount of date. Create a pitch of how you're gonna sell this to them. Why are you doing it? Remember who it is and why you're doing it. Why are you adding insurance? And to be very honest with you, it doesn't have to be about them. It has to be about the business. We are adding insurance right now because for eight months, I'm hemorrhaging money. I wish it was different, but it's not. I want you to be successful and I want you to have year-round employment with me and I want to grow this business. Do you see yourself as being a partner here and growing with me? These are things you must share. Next, present the pitch to your business or your employees, like I said. Be firm about your intentions and expectations. I intend everybody to have their license this year and I expect it to be done by. And then last but not least, make sure you put that in their contracts or some sort of written agreement. Don't allow anybody to come into your business anymore without actually having your intentions and expectations outlined. Your new team, this is gonna be easy to sell by the way to your new team because they have no clue what's going on. Whatever you say to them, they have to do. That's what I love about the new team. Let's go to the existing one though. Oh, well, first off, I have to give you some cautionary things. I remember this. Don't blow it. Never ever say these. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. I'll just hire insurance agents to work specifically in that area of our office. You'll come around. <laughs> don't worry about it. You'll come around. This is gonna be for the new staff. You don't have to do it. Don't say that crap to your new team and your old team. So your existing team, again, or keep on with this mantra, which is refrain from saying the following. This is how we used to do it. We are now going to do it this way, not like we old way. We wanna be, no one, no, not everyone does this. When you make it sound like the things that you're doing are different, when you make it sound like the things that you've once done have changed and everybody else has done it this way except for this time, then you put doubt in their mind that the things that you changed are right. It's just how we do it. It's, that's it. We run this play this way and that's it. It's not how we used to, forget it. It's done, right? We don't, what, what is lip tax? That's it, nothing. Don't even talk about it again. Phoenix and that's it. Best practices, always speak as if you are what you want to be. We do it all. All of our staff knows insurance and taxes. We expect our employees to be licensed. This is how it's always been. Keep the tone of your business focused on what it is you do now, not what you did in the past. Share your vision as often as possible. Here's how you share it. We have an opportunity to share with our new recruits the future of our business and what opportunities uh, lie ahead. Two thirds of employees are not motivated by money. Selling this opportunity to make more money isn't the way to get it across. Don't speak specifically about money. Speak in generalities, especially if you don't know much of either. 
paint the picture of how things <coughs> will be if they follow you. Money isn't always the motivator, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm getting at here when you share your vision. I don't want you to walk into the room and say, okay, we're going to add insurance. And because we're adding insurance, your income's going to double and yours is going to triple. And I know you're going to get the new car. All that is going to come with preparation, time. But the way you sell this is an opportunity to grow themselves. I have found that the reason that I keep and retain great people is because I'm not selling them on pay. Because I tell them all the time, I wish I could pay you more. I think you deserve more. It's tough, but we're not making enough money to pay you more. If you want to make more money, let's make some more money. That's simple. I always tell my team that. And I do base pay, and I'm sorry, I give incentives to raise their pay based on production, on results. Never just start somebody off at a high rate. And I'll, I'll tell you this right now, and just a side note, you get people who come to you applying saying, I have so many years of experience. I have this X, Y, and Z. Here's the, here's the end of the day. They have experience. They have some sort of background somewhere, somewhere else, not with you. If they want to come and work with you, they start at the bottom. It's what it is. Just what it is. We're not hiring executives. <laughs> We're not looking for somebody who's got experience running a Fortune 500 company. We're looking for people who are hungry, people who want to be coached and who want to follow you. They have to follow you. I want people to say, I follow you because I trust you, because you're confident, because you've told me the way and now you're going to show me the way. It's what it is. I know you can do this. Share the plan. After you've crafted a plan, you need to share this with your team. I recommend choosing a sidekick. And that could be somebody who you're going to partner with. Step three, presenting the opportunity. Let's call this what it is, an opportunity. This isn't change. This is progress. As we referenced before, change will cause challenges. Our job as leaders is to not get caught up in buying into the challenges. It's an opportunity. So the end here, we must be prepared to convert any negative into a positive. We must be prepared to resist agreeing with objections and we must be prepared to bring a game plan to anything we wanna execute. All of this happens and occurs in building a vision for your staff and your team as you go into this season. Now I share all this with you because I had to undergo these same objections in my head. I had to become the leader that I am today based on all these things. I mean, I created this. Now, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that I'm perfect or I do all these things so great and everybody just follows me. Trust me, I have people quit. I have people that I terminate. In fact, if I look back from when I started an insurance business, which was about six years ago, a little over six years ago, there's only one person who is still with me today that started with me in the insurance business. Just one. Yes, that's it. And the reason that is, is because I have weeded out the people who didn't believe in our business, who didn't think that it was about them and understood it was about the business. That I could tell and share with them my vision and they would just, you know, follow. It's hard, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to lie. In fact, it has become so hard to find people that believe in us and stay with us that every day, I mean, literally, I, people are quitting all the time here. In our stores, you may think I have perfect retention or any of that. No way. Actually, I turn over people so quickly because they can't stand the pressure because it's my business. This is what you need to do. These are my expectations. In fact, I had somebody quit just this morning. I have never had this problem before, actually. I've always had. Or, I mean, it's getting progressively worse. I'll just tell you that. But I guess, well, it depends on how you see it. It's not progressively worse. It's actually getting progressively better. People are actually just firing themselves, if you will. They do it to themselves. Correct. The, the girl who quit this morning, she sent us an email saying, I didn't want to quit, but I know eventually I was going to get fired. <laughs> she says, I knew there was going to be a point where I wouldn't meet expectations. That's exactly what she said. And I know if you ask Karen, she could show you. And I said, Karen and, and Sandra are district manager, area managers, and they were stressing out about it. I said, you know what, guys? Don't stress on this. I said, don't stress on that. I said, if this girl quit, that's great. You didn't have to fire her because you were going to do it anyways. Let them quit because your expectations of them are high, and if they can't meet them, that's it. They quit. 
perfect, perfect. And you'll see that in our organization, there'll probably be a lot of change in my business. Every, every quarter, every year, you're either going to see a new face or one less face. I'm going to be honest with you in the tax business and in the insurance business from a freedom perspective. I don't want you to think that we have high turnover because, well, people just don't want to work here. I'm going to tell you people are going to quit. I, I seldomly fire people. And it's not because I don't have a heart of gold and I just don't want to fire people. I just don't get around to it. They do it before me. <laughs> this is to share with you that sharing your vision is important. And here's my commitment to you. During this upcoming tax school, which we all run, even we run it, I'll be sharing with you an updated presentation. I've shared with some of you already who have been with us and some of you decided not to use it. And some of you said, well, I'm not ready to use it. That's okay. I get it. Let me share some things with you about tax school that changed for us over the last two years. And then this will share with you exactly how we build people. In the last two years, we've gone from a tax school pricing of $99 to selling the course for $497. $497 is what people pay to join tax school here. Okay. $497. Correct, it does. But it still doesn't make it fair because I'm telling you it's still way overpriced. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying it's undervalued. I'm just saying that's a lot of money to get somebody to pay that's looking for a job. Okay? Now, we've done this over the years because we built tremendous value in our course, but as well as our sales pitch. My sales pitch, when I come up to sell this, and it's not just me, I've trained my staff to do this. When they sell tax school, they don't just sell tax school anymore. It's an opportunity to join a team, an opportunity to grow, where we illustrate what we've done and accomplished, not only as a team, but each other. I allow our team, we have, we have uh, testimonial videos of people who started with us as tax pros who today run stores, who are making lots of money. Our number one sales agent in our stores who runs one of our stores. I mean, just uh, on Saturday, we had the end of the season party. On Saturday at the end of the season party, she got a $5,000 check from us. That was just, that was just from, from the last two months of tax season. Imagine what she got the first two months. <coughs> and she started as a tax pro. And if you would have met her as a tax pro, let me tell you something. You would have never picked this girl. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have bet on her. I'm not even joking. I wouldn't have put any money on this girl. Not to disrespect her, but she wasn't management material. Today, she's our number one sales agent, number one manager. She produces at a high level. But I put so many expectations and demands on her, but she falls in line. What I mean by that is she understands what we're doing and want to accomplish and why we're going to accomplish it and how we're going to accomplish it because I sell the vision to them often, every single day day. And I do this because I want them to know that not only I'm the boss, but I want them to know if I'm a confident boss leader, then they will follow. If I share with them vague stories about how we're going to try to do something or how they should get licensed or how they should inspire their team, it never works. You have to be stern. You have to be direct and you have to accomplish. It. Any questions? I hope I didn't beat you up. I don't want to beat you up. Does this all make sense? Yes. Do you know these people you're going to go back and fire now? <laughs> you're going to fire yourself? Boom. That's it. Get out of here, bro. <laughs> well, you don't have to go back and fire people. What you need to do is start looking for better people. That's it. And I know some of you struggle because I've had conversations with some of you about people. And it has to start here before it starts out there. You have to become a better leader before you can actually go out and get new people and train people and develop people. Because if they see a weak leader, they won't follow you. They won't listen to you. They won't take direction from you. And I wasn't the leader. So if you think that David has just got better skills than me, it's not my skills, guys. It's because I've worked really hard to do it. And I think you all have it in you. I know that for a fact because you're here. It's not even I think, I believe. You're here today because you've made a decision you wanted to grow your business. So you've already made that decision. Now it's how do I inspire the others in my organization who are holding me down or who are resisting change to do this? And if they're not anybody there because I'm still working on building my team, then how do I become the leader so that when I do start inspiring others, they follow? And when they follow, 
they drive and they develop. And how do I get them to quit on their own when they know they're not meeting my expectations? Because I have a game plan and I'm positioned to succeed. These are the things that we have to think about as leaders. And this is why it's so important that you share your vision so often with your staff and your team. I share it all the time. I think I'm probably at least half of the time I spend with anybody in our organization, I'm telling them what is our goal for this week or this month or this year or this quarter? And what does that mean for them? So I don't always just make it about me. I always tell them, if you do this, look at what your bonus looks like. Look what your vacations are going to look like. Look how I can help you. And I do things above and beyond. And this is just to give you some ideas, not to brag, just to give you ideas so you can help. Like I'll bring in medical professionals to talk to them about healthcare planning. I'll bring in, I'll bring in somebody about credit repair. We just brought credit restoration specialists just this past week so they could learn about how to better manage their credit and their finances. All right, everybody back? Okay, just give me like four minutes. Uh-huh. All right, um, we have brought in people. And in fact, uh, I'm gonna give you one and then we're done. And I'm gonna share with you is this one that I have. This is set up for the first Tuesday of of June, I don't know what that day is, but every Tuesday I do a manager training and that's with our store managers. And I don't do it actually, Karen and Sandra do the training. I just kind of guessed in this thing some days. And sometimes I guessed in it just as, just to reaffirm the things that I expect of them and everybody in the organization. But here's one thing I'm doing with them this, this coming week or this coming month that I believe is gonna change. And I guess before I get there, let me share with something else with you. In order for you to grow as a leader, in order for you to grow people, you have to be fully transparent. And that means showing your financials. So reason I say that is because people just think you're rich. Your your employees think you're really rich. I don't care if you don't look like you're rich. I promise you, they think you're rich. And you know what the definition of rich is to them? More money than them. (laughs) Right? And you're making money off of their sweat on their backs, if you will. You know what I mean? Okay? So if you're not sharing your financials with them, that's probably one of the reasons they don't trust you. So share your financials. But, and to be clear, I share financials with all my managers of every store to every dollar we make and every dollar we spend. Every dollar we make and every dollar we spend. Now, I don't share it for the entity though. I mean, that may be a Karen or a George or somebody higher up in our organization that knows everything about our business. But for a store, they know how much their water bill, their light bill, how much payroll was, and how much money came through the doors. They know it. Okay but I still don't think they get it because they're not invested. So this month, because we're running our first full month after tax season, I've actually made a decision that I'm going to go and I'm going to take out cash from the bank, the exact amount of money that each store generated in sales this past month. I'm going to take out all the cash. I'm going to put it on a stack and I'm going to give it to each one of them in this training room. It's going to happen. Uh, whatever the the Tuesday is, because it's every Tuesday. I'm going to show them the money they made. And then I'm going to outline all the expenses and have them take it out of the pile. And I'm going to show them profits or losses. So they can actually see what money looks like. Because they don't see that shit. They just see a number on a piece of paper and they think I'm rich. If I show them how much money is actually leaving the damn store, they'd be like, whoa. Because their payroll makes up a good damn portion of it. And that I need them to see. I've never done this before. I thought about this about a week ago and I was going to do it this past week, but then I thought, no, let me finish the month so I can lock out that P and L because I do monthly P and L's with every store. I'm going to show them. You're going to fly in. Yeah, You like it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> with the mask. <laughs> Everybody's going to come in with a gun. Hey, man, I heard there's some money in here. <laughs> Trust me, man. I, I tell you these things not to impress you anyway. This isn't to impress upon you the things that I have to run through in my mind. Now, if you don't believe you're at that stage in your business yet, that's okay. But you need to start making incremental changes to be able to become that leader, which is share as much as possible. Be very fully transparent. If your team thinks that all you do is make a ton of money and you're rich, they'll never work as hard for you as they could. If they think that you're not a confident leader, if you think you're not prepared, they'll never trust you. Vision is about becoming a great leader that shares the vision that they can believe in, right? That's, that's, that's just what it is. We're going to go here and this is how we're going to get there and everybody join me. And if you don't want to join me, that's cool. Jump off the bus. We'll leave you here. We'll pick up somebody else to fill your spot. 